Kia ora, g'day and welcome to the history of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Episode 113, Rongnoa Māori with Donna Kerridge. This podcast is recorded in Te Whanganui Atara, on the rohe of Muaupoko, Taranaki Whanui, Te Atiawa and Ngāti Toa Rangatira. We are generously supported by our amazing patrons. If you want to support Hans, go to patreon.com slash history Aotearoa. Today, I have something very exciting to share with you. In episode 111, we heard about what Rongnoa Māori was like hundreds of years ago. But Rongnoa, as with all Māori culture, is still alive and thriving today. So, how is Māori medicine applied in a more modern context? To answer that question, I reached out to the knowledgeable Donna Kerridge. Donna is a Rongnoa Māori practitioner and founder of Order New Zealand, a company that delivers, quote, organisational hauora Māori policy and advisory services, presentations and training programmes, end quote. She's spent the last decade or so advising the government on policies related to Rongnoa Māori, which most recently has been in relation to the Therapeutic Products Bill, which we will discuss later in the episode. Apologies in advance if there is any audio issues. We had some technical problems that meant we had to record on Zoom. So if the audio is less than ideal, that's why. But hopefully that doesn't detract too much from the amazing knowledge that Donna has to share. Enjoy. So yeah, once again, thank you very much for um, coming on to talk to me all about who you are, what you do and all that sort of stuff. Um, I've been researching, um, well, I have uh, recently actually just released an episode about Māori medicine, which I found very, very interesting, which is why I kind of wanted to get you on, wanted to talk to you. Um, because as far as I can tell, you seem to be one of the major authorities in New Zealand about um, about it, <laughs> shaking your head. Um well, I did. The, I, it's because I discovered a, um, a, a interview that you did with RNZ a few months ago, and I was like, I'll save that for later. Um, and so then I pulled it up again recently, and that's when I flicked you the email. So, um, so yeah, thank you um, again for coming on. It is um, great to have experts, and I know the listeners will be very, very chuffed um, or very, very excited to have um, have you on and, and be able to pick your brains and hear what you have to say. So yeah, do you want to tell us a bit about bit about yourself and kind of how you got into um, practicing Rongnoa Māori? Tēnā koutou koutou, oh, tēnā koe. Um, ko Donna Kiris tōku ingoa, nō wā katoa hau, he uri o Ngāti Tahinga me Ngāti Mahuta hoki, he kai rongoa a hau. So my name's Donna, I'm a Rongoa Māori practitioner. I hail from the Waikato. My, I've been practicing Rongoa Māori now consciously for 20 plus years. I'm certainly no expert. I guess one of the things about Rongoa Māori, the more you learn, the more you realise that you don't know. So I think I'm definitely a long way short of um, the experts we had a long time ago. But I do enjoy Rongoa, have um, served on a number of expert advisory panels with regard to uh, rongoa. My passion really is the practice. Unfortunately, I'm I'm assuming for my sins that I um, have fallen more into the advocacy space, but I look forward to the day when that's no longer required and we can just practice. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, no, it's... um. Yeah, and no, I definitely know that that feeling with my bit of my work as well in conservation is um you like to be on the tools. Yeah. Um and when you start sort of uh, you know, having to do other things, you it's not quite the same. You just want to get out of there, do the thing. So I guess um and and you talking about the um, you know, previous people that have come before you, um 
how has Rongwa sort of changed over the years, um, I guess, since Europeans have, have turned up here in Aotearoa and, um, you know, things have progressed from there? Is it still the same compared to what it was a few hundred years ago or is it sort of changed quite drastically? One of the things that I'd say about the changes of Rongwa Māori over the years is that they have been positive and not so positive. Māori are very adaptive culture. We have had to evolve in order to survive, and Rongwa is no exception to that rule. We have had to evolve in terms of the new challenges we see in terms of our health and well-being that didn't exist years ago. I'm not really talking about diseases. I'm talking more about lifestyle, about the resources that are available or unavailable to us, as well as the transference of knowledge that has changed. So there are also aspects of our culture and of our rongoa Māori practice that are being influenced by the majority. So we find ourselves as Māori, as a minority living in our own country, we have a democratic system, which means that the voice of the majority carries the weight and the decision-making powers. So that's definitely had an impact on, on our practice and the way the rest of the country and ourselves as colonised people can sometimes view our traditional practices, whether that's rongoa, whether that's uh, whakairo, whether that's tongapur or some of our other um, healing practices that we have. I think for me the biggest challenge is, is ensuring that we can fully appreciate the depth of the history of our practice of the matauranga or the knowledge base that helps inform us so that we are able to apply that in a modern context. So some of our, our methods might change over time but certainly not the underpinning philosophy of the practice and I can see that being lost when it is constantly compared to Western healthcare systems, when it is translated into Western healthcare systems, that some of that detail and that really important uh, way of knowing, doing and being and understanding our world slowly gets chipped away. Mm. And that's a real risk for me in terms of we don't, as a Rungwa Māori practitioner, I'm not striving to be a medical doctor. I'm not striving to justify what I do based on somebody else's game plan. Um, you know, I often say to people when they go, oh, look, no, you need to do this and you need to do that because those are those are our rules, those, those are our laws, those kind of things. And I think, well, there's no good me taking soccer rules to a rugby game. So we're having to learn to walk in both worlds, but at the same token, we don't want to lose sight of what it is that drives us and enables us to, um, or for the Western system, to complement the work that we do. I'm, I'm really grateful for the advances in medical science. I'm really grateful for the opportunities that we have today that we didn't have a long time ago. I think my grandparents would be, very grateful for the choices that we have as modern people living here in Aotearoa. However, they would also, as I am, be saddened by the lifestyles that we have chosen for ourselves or that have been put upon us due to the fact that we live in different times. So I guess to sum that up, living, living today is very different from a long time ago but I think the values of a long time ago would serve us well today. Mm. So you've touched on actually quite a few things that I want to delve in a little bit deeper there. In particular, I guess the, um, uh, not necessarily the comparison to um, Western medicine, but sort of how Rongnoa fits into Western medicine, because obviously Western medicine is the, um, kind of most dominant form of um, healthcare here in New Zealand. So how does Rongnoa fit into kind of the healthcare space when you've got 
you know, such a, you know, to use a corporate term, someone who's got a, such a major market share um, in in the country. How does how does Rongnoi kind of fit into that? So I don't think it does. I don't think it fits into that model. If it did, I don't think that it would be true to what it is and to its origins. There would be far too many compromises needed to be made that we might not recognise ourselves or our practices. I think that our diversity or our differences are the gift we bring and that they should be, you know, it is our differences that creates more choice for the public of Aotearoa. It provides greater opportunities where some things are uh, not working. It provides another opportunity for us to explore and to help improve the health and well-being of all of us who live here in Aotearoa. Why would we want to dumb that down to a single perspective by morphing into um, a system that's already well embedded and um, and dominant? We are better to have more ways of knowing and understanding the world so that we, are, we might be weak in some things. We can excel. And I think for me, I quite often hear the word integration, and I know it's semantics, but for me it's really important. I, you know, my goal is not to integrate with Western medicine. Western, me, Western medicine does fine on its own, with its own rules, its own way of knowing and understanding the world and the the disease that um, that is inflicted upon our people today. They're perfectly good the way they are. I don't want to change the way they do it. As is Rungwa Māori. Rungwa Māori has another way of understanding the world, has another way of helping support the well-being of our people. And I think when you integrate those two ways, it requires one or both parties to give up something of who we are in order to be able to work together. And I quite often uh, use the analogy of, look, if I'm going to come into the medical world, could you guys just leave your science at the door? Because I don't get it. I, ju I just don't get it. So if you could leave that at the door, we'd get along just fine. And then I can see the doctor's going, yep, all well and good. But if you guys could just leave your wairua, your spiritual stuff at the door, because gosh, I don't get that, um, then we're going to be able to work together really well. And then what happens is when my mukapuna is on the surgeon's table, and I've just asked him to leave all his science at the door, that would be probably the dumbest thing I could have done. If if a medical doctor is working on my mukapuna, then you bring everything in your toolbox to the table, please, and I will bring everything in my toolbox to the table. So let's not compromise our ability in order to only work on the ground that is common because that takes the, the essence out of both our work. What I'd like to be able to say is, you bring everything you have, I'll bring everything I have, and let's collaborate where we can. Let's take the, the strengths of what you do, the strengths of what I do, and help give the people that we both serve choice in their care. Fantastic. So I think, um, I, I guess to, to that kind of uh, analogy there, I think one of the things that I, one of the questions I had when I started researching this, and probably other people have as well, is um, what does a typical uh, Rongo Māori consultation look like? If someone comes into you saying, you know, I've got pain or, or whatever, what what does it actually look like? How do you know? How does that? Um, also, I guess, how does that compare? That if I go into my GP, how is that? different what are the different questions that you ask what are the different processes that you go through to determine how you're going to treat them well I think it's firstly it's important to recognize that every Rungwa Māori practitioner is different in their approach to how they work with people and I can only talk to that which I engage with so um, an example I like to share with people is one of a truck driver who may have damaged his ankle quite severely needed um, surgery to help repair it, but for whatever reason is still not healing as we would expect. So our um, 
our truck driver might come to me and go, look, this is just not working. Is there anything you can do? My approach to that discussion would be, can you tell me what really pains you about this in injury? What is it that's really bothering you about this injury? And if I can play the, the injured party, I can imagine that this person would say to me, well, actually, the thing that really bothers me about this injury is the fact that I'm currently unable to earn a living or as much of a living as I did in the past, and now I can't put food on my table. And as a consequence, my wife has had to take a second job, and I'm left at home to care for the children. And I'm not doing that particularly well. As a result of all that comes from not being able to care for your own family, for your own children. So that might progress on to a conversation about how did you injure your ankle? I injured it falling down the back step. Let's have a look at your back step. Oh, I can see it's rotten. It's probably going to happen again. How about the first thing we do is get that, fi that step fixed so that we don't repeat the injury. Let's go. How about I go down to our local college, talk to some of the teachers down there, see if we can't get some of the people looking for NCA, NCA credits to come and repair that. We'll go and talk to the local MITRE 10. We'll get some materials, some offcuts, and we'll get the teacher up here to supervise, and let's get that step fixed. Now, the next thing that you mentioned to me was putting food on your table. How about we go down to the local food bank, and, you know, the, the thought of that is horrific for people that are full of pride. And so let's go down there and let's see if we can't get you access to some support with food for your family. And don't feel shy about that. Our words would be whakama, but I'm trying to avoid those words for the general population who might be listening to this. It's okay. The, list, the, the listeners will know those sorts of words. Um, I've trained them up well. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, then. So I would be saying, I would be saying to, to our person, don't be whakama. Because when you're healed, you can go back and volunteer down there. You can help. So, you know, don't be afraid to, to take support from your community. Now, the other thing is that you're having difficulty looking after the children in the evening while, you're, while your wife is out at work. You can't bath them. You can't get around the table and things like that. So do you have a niece or nephew or somebody who could come in for an hour a day and help you know, feed the children, bathe the children, get them ready for bed. Would that be a help to you? And given that you're a professional driver, could you do that in exchange for some driving lessons when you're well for these young people? Would that work for you? Oh, heck yes. Okay, so shall we tee this all up? Take care of the things that bother you most about this injury. And now let me have a look at your ankle and see if there's something I can do with your ankle. That would be fairly typical of, of how I would approach people. Often we come with injuries, with illnesses that are not just physical. They're compounded by other things or created or have their origins in other things. And that's not looking for the, the big, long-winded drama that might go with some of our illnesses. That's not what it's about for me. It's about getting to how this issue is impacting their life and addressing the big picture, the whole picture, rather than, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to bathe that ankle in some tupakahi or tutu. We're going to bathe that, that regularly in that. We're also going to do a hot compress with that plant. It's an amazing plant for healing bones and deep, deep muscle wake. So we could do all of that, but without attending to those other things, that is often what slows our healing, is the fact that we've become shy or shamed about the fact that we can't look after our family. We feel emasculated because we can't do these things, and they become much bigger issues than the fact that you have a sore ankle. Mm. And so we have to deal to all of them in order for people to be well. Rungwa Māori, from my perspective, is not about disease. 
We, we can tend to disease, but our focus is the people, the people in the place. So I guess for me, it all about Māori is about lifting the mana and modi of people and place. And by place, I mean our whenua, our taiao, our natural world. If the land is not well, we are not well. And so we need to make sure that we're working in concert with the much bigger picture, because if we work against it, if we're trying to paddle up the river, then um, it makes life a lot more difficult for us. So we're better to work in with the natural environment in order that it be well so that we can be well as well. Great. So it's kind of, I guess, slightly to that end, um, you were talking earlier about, you know, taking the strengths of, of both sides of Western medicine and Rongnoa. Do you what I guess do you think um Western doctors could learn from um Rongnoa Māori? Um what aspects of it do you think is I guess Western medicine is lacking that maybe um those Western doctors could um maybe take on board a bit more? I might have a different view to other people, mm -hmm. but I don't I don't think there's anything wrong with Western medicine. Mm -hmm. I think I think the issue is with the practice. I think it's that we've built a system that says you can only sit with a patient for this long. Otherwise, you become uneconomical in terms of a business model. So you must fire these people through in, in um, predetermined regularity. I think it's reintroducing the human aspect of the practice back into medicine. That's not to say that Rungwa Māori practitioners can't learn a lot from Western medicine practitioners as well. However, if I were to have one criticism of our health system as it stands today, is that it has lost the element of humanity, both for the people that work in the system and the people that it serves. Never before in Aotearoa have we had a workforce, a health workforce, that is so desperately depleted, that is so exhausted, that is so hamstrung in what it can and can't do for people because of best practice. The whole system is designed, in my view, the whole system is designed to remove the human element of the practice that the people delivering signed up to do. And I never want to see that happen to Rungwa Māori. Mm. The practice itself, the technology available, I think that the practice, that the the philosophy and the and the actual Western medicine is fine. It's the way we implement it. It's the way we carry it out. That's the problem. And it's not better or worse. It's not better or worse than Rungwa Māori and vice versa. You know, one perspective is not the only perspective. And I just feel like in terms of healthcare here in Aotearoa, with a really diverse population, we are cutting our nose off to spite our face by constantly insisting that we have one system for all people. Why on earth would we do that? It just defies logic from my perspective. Mm. The more diversity we have, the better. We have an increasingly diverse population. So how is it that our Asian whānau heal best? I don't know the answer to that. I'm not Asian. But I'd really like to think that they had access to the tools and the knowledge they need in order for them to be well based on their DNA, based on their value structure. And as Māori, we are asking for no more than that for ourselves and anyone else who may choose to access that. Mm -hmm. We get caught up in the Western system. We criticise the Western health system unfairly. I sound like I'm sticking up for them. But we 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 criticize the Western health system unfairly because we lump in there 
the capitalistic concept. It's the capitalistic approach that most people have a problem with in the health system. Not the health system itself. It's the capitalism, the importance of doing things a certain way and using a certain business's products that are tainting and destroying that system. And I would hate to see that happen to us. Hmm. I would I would really not like to see that. Yeah, you're uh, you're really speaking uh, uh, really speaking my language here with this real anti <laughs> anti capitalistic stuff because I yeah hundred percent agree it's um yeah it, it's yeah as I said speaking to a very deep part of me there. <laughs> well, I think if we, I think if you're a true capitalist, you would see the errors of your ways mm. because you have a very finite resource base that is might last your lifetime if you're lucky but probably not and you really need to take the long-term view Mm. and the long-term view is something that I don't see a lot of our business models taking their long-term view is for my term on the board their long-term view maybe at best for my heirs and successors but it's certainly not for the life of the planet or the life of my great-grandchildren or my grandchildren. Mm. We may need to take a much longer view. And so what worked, you know, what worked 100 years ago in terms of business doesn't work today. And what we're doing today is going to severely reduce our choices for the future. So I think their model, of which I have no expertise to be talking about but it does it does reek of short term views for short term gain and the whole concept is about i win by taking more than i give and sooner or later the human species is going to have to realize that we are only one tiny part in a in a world of multiple much more than we can count moving parts in order to get the outcomes we want so yeah I think that would be my one view my one criticism of the health system is that our human capitalistic perspectives about what success looks like is at odds with the L-O-R-E, the law of nature, of which we are a part and of which we cannot, no matter how clever we think we are, disassociate ourselves from. Mm. Amazing. So to, I guess to to change tack slightly, something else that I, um, uh, I, I guess I was wondering, and I'm sure a lot of other people are, is that in other aspects of Te Ao Māori, um, you know, non Māori are rightly considered not to be um, welcome in those spaces um, for a variety of reasons. One of those generally being colonization and that sort of stuff. So, what are your thoughts on non Māori seeking um, rongoa for their health needs? Do you think it's something that should be exclusively for Māori, or do you think it's something that could be, or yeah, do you think Pākehā and and other um, cultures uh, also do you think are able to act, should be accessing it as well? The best way I can answer that question is with the words of my mother and her father and their family is, Donna, if they need food, give it to them. If they need help, help them. If they need healing, heal them. And that goes for everybody. There's no, I never saw that demarcation in my whānau. Mm -hmm. If there were people up the road, farmers up the road that needed help, then because we had a rather large workforce, i.e. family, then we were sent to help them. If people needed feeding, my grandfather would bring them home and he would feed them and he would give them a job, and then he would send them on their way. And so I feel much the same. Rungoa Māori 
is the gift that Māori bring, a gift that Māori bring to this world for the benefit of all people. I would never turn anyone away who was not for the reason that they weren't Māori. Then I don't know whether others do that. I don't, I just mm. don't know. But yeah, it doesn't go with the kaupapa that I was taught. Yep. The kaupapa I was taught, if you see somebody who needs feeding, feed them. If you see somebody who needs help and you can, then help them. If you need somebody, if you have somebody who needs healing and you're capable of helping, then make sure you do. That was the way I was brought up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I guess uh, the, <laughs> to move into more sort of modern things that have been happening recently, I think um, we can't talk about health and well-being um, in 2023 without talking about COVID, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. So how how did things change? How was Rongua implemented during lockdown and during COVID? Um, did it change? Were people finding it more useful? Was it difficult? Because, um, as you say, a lot of rongoa is very personal. It's, uh, you know, um, you know, everything changed with COVID. So how how were things different? What was what happened there, I guess, is the <laughs> crux of the question. Well, talking from my own experience, I mean, I can talk on the big, big level as well, but I'd rather just talk to my own experience. Absolutely. So it required... For me personally, it required me to flip the way I work and to change a number of thoughts that I had about how it all should be delivered, needs to be delivered, all of those kinds of things. And I learned really, really quickly with lockdown that sometimes you've got to get out of your way and make the best of what you've got. And rather than always expecting everything to be perfect and in an ideal world, we had a lockdown where we had our coma to a queer, in my experience, afraid to go to the hospital when they needed hospital care because they were afraid that they would catch COVID or die. Most of them don't like hospitals anyway. In fact, I don't know anybody who does like hospitals. You only go to hospital if you're really, really sick. And that's the only time you like them because you feel like you have no other choice. However, my experience was many of the old people from where I come from were not accessing the health care in a that they needed in a timely manner. They preferred to stay home. They didn't want to go and have to stay in a hospital and therefore increase the chances of catching COVID and therefore probably dying given all the reports that we got. I also found that um, what happened was the people didn't want to put their own family at risk that our old people didn't want to put our young people at risk by requiring them to leave the safety of their homes and taking them to the doctors or to the hospital. Some of our caregivers who were dropping off welfare packages to Fano were noticing that people weren't getting the care that they needed. They couldn't be talked into going to the hospital or to the doctors. So they asked some of them, would you be more comfortable talking to a Roma practitioner? Many of them opted for that. So I was getting phone calls and people were ringing me and asking me questions about their health and, or actually mostly it was family of our old people who were ringing and going, look, I'm really worried about Nan's leg. Um, I think she should go to the hospital. She doesn't want to go. So for those who had young people around them, we were able to use technology for me to be able to see what's going on and to advise them accordingly. What I learned was I now had willing helpers that could be my eyes, my ears, my hands. And so that was really good. But the one thing about telehealth, which I never rated, was you can get to look into, into somebody's home. You can see the support they have at home, not just what they tell you when they come to see you. You can see what they need and you can see what support they have. And so that helps with your advice and support that you can offer them. So that was a real plus, having that technology inside the home. The other, um, other advantage that COVID taught me was that you could tell everybody the same story at once so that nobody felt like they were left out in the cold in Nana's care, that everybody felt like they had 
all heard the same story and that they could all pitch in and help given their respective gifts in their care. So we didn't have whānau that were alienated. We had a lot more willing helpers and there was much less confusion within the family. So it was a real plus. What was really not good was the loneliness for those that found themselves totally isolated. And I'm not sure that that's come right. I see the people that were isolated over that time, their health deteriorate, their sense of self-worth deteriorate, and a growing fear that it could be repeated. And so it's had huge consequences, huge consequences on what our, um, how our people deal with the wellness of whānau and people trying to dismiss things because they couldn't get professional advice and watching those things exacerbate into things bigger than they needed to be. So for me, as a result of taking all these phone calls from people going, you know, look, I've got this. Is there any wrong I can take? I don't like taking these pills or those pills. And one of the funny things that I've said to people is, do they work? And, you know, quite often they'll go, yeah, but I don't like those. I want to use ours. And I go, does it cause you any other problems? Have you got any issues with taking these medicines? Or are they just working and you're actually quite happy, except for it's got an English name on the label instead of a Māori name? Is that our problem? In some cases it was. And it's like, okay, well, look, we can swap that out for something. It's going to take quite a while because we have to transition from one to the other in a safe way and in a coordinated way across your health carers. And so it could take us between three to six months to get to a space where if it's appropriate, we can move you to a rongwa with a Māori name on it. And in the meantime, there could be some discomfort as we transition. And if that's what you want, we can work down that path. And as soon as we can, we'll talk to your medical practitioner and we'll work together to move you to that place if that's the right thing for you. Most of those who found their medications were working for them with no ill side effects opted to stay where they were, but they felt much more comfortable about staying there because they felt they now had the choice. Mm. Whereas before they felt there was no choice. Mm. So I think it taught us an awful lot, but all these questions that came in were almost, they were forming a pattern. Lots of the people were concerned about the same things. So I decided that what I would do was start, well, a blog, even though I didn't really know what a blog was. Still don't really know. Um, I think it's just where you write a whole lot of stuff every now and then. Anyway, I thought I would start repeating the questions and writing down my responses because they're pretty typical and then put it into an ebook, which I thought was quite clever so that people could just access this and Farno could do it together and we could help explain some of the issues and the options for people so that those that were too shy to ask still had it if they wanted it anyway. So we did that and then a dear friend of mine, and I'm going to mention his name, Riri Atamakiha, came to me and said to me, Donna, how many of our old people are going to read an e-book? I mean, good point. Hmm. But I don't have the money to go and print this off and distribute it. And he goes, go print a thousand, I'll pay for it and distribute them how they need to be. So that was really generous. And, and it's a case of how Māori, we all kind of work together to, to help restore the health and well-being of our people. And it wasn't long after that that a, an American now living in New Zealand philanthropist also said, go and print 5,000 for it, and then you can distribute them around the country as need be. So that was really a case of the community getting on 
was what needed to be done and sharing information in a safe way and in a way that our people will access it. Unlike my get it up on the web, let people download it um, and use it that way. But the practicality is some of our whānau, especially our remote whānau, don't have access, you know, through mm. um, to the internet due to, you know, our terrain and things like that and cost. So it was a perfect solution. And we're really good at sharing stuff like that. So it reminded us of the power that sits within us as communities. We don't have to sit there. We don't have to wait wait for handouts from the system. We can pool our resources with the help of others and we can get the job done. So COVID was a really good opportunity for Māori to do what Māori do best. And that is to be Māori and to look after our own. And anybody, I know that's terribly closed doorish, and it's not meant to be that way. When I say our own, I mean my immediate community, wherever they come from. So as well as my whānau, my whānau Māori and the whānau that I live by are my community. And from my perspective, that's what Māori do well. And we've seen it in recent tragedies where Māori have just stepped forward and soothed the situation in a way that politics, that authorities, that systems cannot do because they've been designed to take the human element out of the care. Mm. Yeah, I was I was about to mention that as well, is that we have seen a lot of that with um, the cyclones and things recently, is that, um, yeah, just marae, Māori have stepped up and filled gaps where, um, yeah, as you say, the politics hasn't been there, um, unfortunately. So, um, which has been um, unfortunate, I guess, that it needed to happen, but great that it was that it could happen and that it did happen. I guess is how you might might put that. <laughs> Look, one thing I would say is that Maori performed best in all the wrong statistics in this country. Mm. So we are the least educated. We are the least wealthy. We are the most incarcerated. All of these things are facts. However, how is it that the sickest, dumbest, poorest race in this country can stand up an event overnight for thousands of people with no budget, no event manager, no venue, no guest list, and we can be ready to manaki people at 6 a.m. the next morning. How is it that the dumbest, sickest, poorest people in this country can do that? We are no other well-resourced organisation, I challenge, could do that so seamlessly. Māori do it when Māori are allowed to be Māori. And the last bastion for us in terms of being allowed to be Māori is a tangihana. No one cares about how and what we do at tangi. And yet, that is where we excel because we are allowed to be Māori. And nobody pokes their nose in to how we do that. So I say that our superpower as Māori is whānau. And we might not be the sharpest tool in the drawer or the wealthiest organisation in the world. But I think that we need to step back and redefine the conversation. It is not about how well we perform based on some academic level. You know, I have academic qualifications. They do not qualify me to be a safe and effective Rungwa Māori practitioner. Although others might suggest they do, they absolutely don't. We may have money in the bank, but that is not what knits us together. What knits us together is our real, is our marae, is our mātauranga, is our whānau. These are the things that make us well. These are the things that allow us to be the best we possibly can be. And it is time that we as Māori choose differently despite somebody else's measures of our success. 
fantastic. Um, and I hate to derail the conversation going back to the government. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, one thing that I did discover is that um, Ronglai had actually um, quite a big win last year with um, ACC, the Accident Compensation Corporation, now offering it, but well, basically they're funding it now, they're offering it as a um, option for people that they will fund. Can you talk a bit about well, I think it's significant. Maybe others might not think it's significant, but can you talk about why that is quite significant? So the ACC service that um, where they've allowed people to elect Rungwa Māori as one of their treatment options has been huge in terms of lifting the credibility of Rungwa Māori in Western medical perspectives or circles. So we've always known it. It's not new. But all of a sudden, there's this newfound love and hope for better outcomes because a government agency has allowed this to happen. So there's this whole assumption that if the government allows it, then it must be good. And so there are benefits and there are downsides to that. The ACC service is not perfect. But in my perspective, and I need to disclose that I'm actually on the ACC and advisory panel, I think it would be disingenuous of me not to disclose that at this point. While it's not perfect, they have, in my view, done the very best they can to go, we are not the experts in the Rungwa Māori space. The healers are. And to an extent, we welcome the advice of the healing community itself. And they need to be acknowledged for that. They, they could have opted to dot the I's and cross the T's so sharply that the service never got off the ground. What we, will we do in this scenario? What will we do in that scenario? How will it be managed? And then without intending to, completely dehumanise the practice of Rongwa Māori. So they've walked a very fine line. There are a number of criticisms about their service, but I don't think you can deny that the good outweighs the shortcomings. When we look at their most recent statistics, 40% of those who opt for Rungwa Māori support in their rehabilitation program, are not Māori. Of the ACC clients that use or opt for rongoa Māori treatment in their rehabilitation require no further treatment for the same injury. Kia ora everyone, Thomas from Post Production here. Just want to make a quick clarification on the statistic Donna just gave. She asked me to clarify that 40% of those who choose Rongnoa for ACC aren't Māori. In addition to this, 73% of those who choose Rongnoa need no further treatment. These statistics are separate. So 40% are not Māori and 73% don't need further treatment. It would be really interesting to see the statistics associated with other options of healthcare because that would have to be pretty high on the radar. And I would like to add that the only reason Rungwa even exists today is because it works. If it didn't work, my mother, her parents wouldn't have perpetuated it because life often held was held by a fine thread there was no time to muck around. If it worked, that was great, and we use it. If it didn't work, we'll bring on the next thing, please. So the only reason it even exists, the only reason we're having this conversation, is because it works. There are also statistics out there. If you look at the MedSafe's website of adverse reactions uh, reported to uh, MedSafe in 2021, I think it was, it was something like 3,100 adverse events reported 
of those 19 were associated with natural health practices. Of those 19, not one was associated with Rungwa Māori. Now, I'm not saying we're perfect. We are prone to mistakes the same as everybody else. But our mistakes are not killing people. Our mistakes are much smaller in number. Even as a percentage of service delivered, the statistics would say we are safer. So people who who come down this path of Rungwa Māori is not safe, there are no regulations in place, there are no backstops, there are no this, there, there are no dehumanising elements to their practice, therefore it must be unsafe. I just don't think you can justify that discussion. I just don't think there is the evidence to support that. And when the first events become public, there have been some events in the past, but I don't whether or not we're bona fide practitioners. Anyway, when these events start to come to light, and they will, there'll be events in the future. Nobody is perfect. Nothing is completely risk-free. You watch the system come down on it like a ton of bricks. And it will. And yet we allow pharmaceuticals, some practices, to continue despite causing much more significant pain and injury to people in terms of a balance of good versus evil. From my perspective, I ask for nothing less for Rongwa Māori. Is that, you know, let's balance the good with the mistakes before we go loading bricks on top of it. Let's hold us to the same measure of safety as we hold everybody else to. And if things start going wrong, one in 65,000 is not significant for the house to be talking about it. Absolutely. So that's, you know, that's what I'm asking, is that we don't all turn around and jump up and down when something goes wrong because a practitioner has acted um, unethically, perhaps. That should not be cast upon the profession. Should not be cast upon the kaupapa. That's a person. And small in number as they are. And if advice is given, you know, it comes down to the practitioner. And Māori have adequately managed the safety of rongoa Māori for hundreds and hundreds of years. And we manage it in a different way to the Western system. But, you know, if I go causing problems, my nannies, long before the courts, will be slapping my ears and telling everybody to take a wide berth from me. And I'll have no patrons, and then I'll have to go and work in the mara, which is arongwa in itself. So, you know, we have our own ways, and nothing works better than the kumara vine. Just because you have a tohu, just because you have a tohu to practice as a dentist doesn't mean you're the kind of dentist I might want to go to. You know, we really do have to do our homework, and we do. We do do our homework. If you're in need of a hip replacement, I'm sure you work out and you ask around who's the best doctor to do that. Well, do the same for Rongwa Māori. Just because they've got Rongwa Māori on their name, do your homework. And and our old people are not shy at calling it like it is. Don't go there, she's a hoha. She's useless. Waste your time. Or don't go there, she's dangerous. And they don't mince their words. But if you go to any professional association where there's a complaint, we are investigating. We have set in place processes so this never happens again. And maybe they'll be held accountable and won't be able to work for two years. And te ao Māori, you're gone. You're gone and there's no coming back. So I think ours is safer. Yeah, no, the the court of public opinion is what some might call it is um, definitely, definitely sometimes more vicious than, than the official system. <laughs> um, so I guess talking about um, a bit more about the official system is, I guess the significant thing going on in the kind of Rongnoa kind of 
governmental space at the moment is the um, therapeutic products bill, which is kind of the the big thing that's got everyone really quite annoyed at the moment, which for listeners who don't know, um, is basically a bill that's currently before parliament. It's designed to regulate medicinal products is in a nutshell what it is. I, I think just to just to call it out, you've been quite vocal in its opposition or in opposition to the bill, at least in its current form. Can you talk about why that is? So the bill, as it currently stands, criminalises the practice of rongoa Māori as I practice it today, and as many other practitioners practice it today. It will require us to seek the permission of the Crown for what we can use in some elements of rongoa Māori, Crown has no expertise in this space, and nor do Māori-paid Crown officials have expertise in this space. So they're not even in a position to be able to do that. It prevents us from making therapeutic claims about what we do, even if they're the truth. So we're not allowed to do that. The Medicines Act currently prevents us as well. I'd like to just make that really, really clear. It's a crazy approach by the Crown. One, it criminalises our practice. Two, it will add layers of overhead to us in the delivery of our services in terms of seeking authority to do what we already have authority to do as mana whenua. So, you know, it's just bureaucracy upon bureaucracy that adds no value. No one's at risk from the law Māori. Not statistically anyway. There's no safety reason why we need to take this path. There's no evidence of risk to safety. And in terms of telling us who we can and can't share our services with, or services and products, if you look at it in a, in a Western perspective, I'm not going to ask anybody for permission to go to my friends in Mexico and say to them, look, you can't get this plant anymore. We have it here in Aotearoa. I can send you some. I can send you heaps for your people that are suffering from whatever. You know, Indigenous to Indigenous trade is really important. And our ability to totoko each other as Indigenous peoples on this planet must be maintained. You can't have some intermediary going, no, sorry, no, you can't send that because New Zealand Incorporated is at risk. We still have to jump through the importation hoops in other countries in order to be able to share our gifts, and rightly so. We don't need another layer of legislation telling us what we can or can't do, and in doing so, perhaps closing some doors to our Indigenous brothers and sisters around the world. So I think that it's been poorly thought through from a rongoa Māori and treaty perspective. In fact, not poorly thought through, ignored. To be fair, it's too hard. It's too hard. So let's not even mention them, but capture them. And that's what the bill does. And in my view, and I'm no legal expert, but in my view, Māori retain rangatiratanga over our taonga within the treaty. We gave our signatures in exchange for that. You can't now go, oh, we can change the rules. Now you come under, all your taonga come under our control. And if you don't like it, pack up and go home. If Māori are no longer free to retain our right of mana motuhake, over our taonga, then all bets are off. The agreement becomes null and void. You know, and that's, I don't mean to be flippant, but if somebody says, you can come and live at my house and return for rent, and they go, okay, I'll live in your house for rent. Oh, but I'm not going to pay you rent now. But I still want to keep living in your house. It doesn't go down very well. Mm. And so I often think that simplistic view calls out the truth and and we can complicate it with detail if we want to but you know the truth is undeniable absolutely our rangatira supported that treaty in exchange for our continued rangatira tanga over our tonga it just it beggars belief 
that anyone, and I'm I'm not into your pro any colour, it's just a biggest belief that you can go, oh, nah, we've had all the goods now and now we're going to take the rest. We're going to control and regulate the best for your own safety. Yeah, no, I think it... Um... Yeah, it, it's it's all part of, I guess, that wider um, treaty discussion, isn't it? Where it's, um, yeah, the the deal has been changed repeatedly um, over the years, um, if you want to put it that way. Um, so, would your view, I guess, um, that the the government basically just, if you want to put it this way, keeps their nose out of where it's not wanted, kind of thing? Is that what you'd feel? That they should be doing, or I guess, in other words, how would you change this bill to better reflect um, Rongoa values? The bill needs to explicitly say that nothing in this bill will impact the practice of Rongoa Māori. They need to be quite specific. And in terms of a way going forward, we need to work together. We need to work together to pool our resources in order to lift the mama and modi of all people and the whenua that we have chosen as our home. Unless we do that, we are going to chew up so much human capital and resources arguing the toss when we could be delivering the goods. And in order to do that, we need to respect each other and each other's ways of knowing, doing and being so that we can provide a richer, longer-lasting solution to the problems and the mamai that we face in this country. Fantastic. So um, I want to, I guess I've got a last couple of few questions for you, which uh, hopefully leave us on a bit more of a positive note. Uh, <laughs> um, awesome. Something that I guess I'm quite interested in is... Um, you know, recently over the last few years, um, mental health has become more of a thing that people are aware of, particularly again with COVID and lockdowns and this sort of thing. So I guess my, something that I'm interested in is uh, Rongoa's applications in terms of mental health. In what ways does it does it help with mental health? In what ways does it incorporate ment- incorporate sorry mental health kind of into the practice? I, I guess I'm interested in everything mental health to do with the practice. I guess if you want to put it that way. So I may differ from other Rongo Maori practitioners on this perspective. For me, Rongo Maori is about reciprocity and balance, and to give focus to one over another doesn't achieve those things. In my view, we need to look at the whole. Now, I think of Modi as the glue between the physical and the spiritual. And from time to time, glue can become a little less sticky. And all was about, you know, securing things back up. Or thinking about Modi as being the zip, the glue between the physical and the spiritual. And some from time to time, the teeth on a zip can become a little bit worn. Rongoa Māori is there just to straighten it up and strengthen it so that people can be can live and operate in balance with the two. To give all your focus to the physical is to distort the balance. To give all your focus to the spiritual element, which is somewhere where we sometimes see the, the mental health space, is in that realm. Um, to give our focus to one or the other actually doesn't work for me. It's about the person, the wholeness of the person, and the bond between those things. So I personally don't step into the mental health space, nor do I step into the cellular level of the physical. I don't go into that kind of stuff. Even though I could, I choose not to, because that would be reframing what I understand Rongoa Māori to be. It's the same as saying Rongoa Māori has a strong focus on cancer. I personally don't believe that. I believe we have a focus on the mana and modi of a person and strengthening the modi despite illness is the goal of Rongoa Māori. So I don't go into what's happening at a cellular level inside the body. I have other people I can go to for that. And they're really good at what they do. I don't go and look into mental health and ignore the spiritual realms that go that that is part of. 
I look at how wairua is being impacted for that person. And I, I don't see wairua and mental health being the same thing. So I don't want to dumb those down. I think we look at what enhances Modi and the mahi in order to lift the mana and Modi of people in place is rungoa Māori. And rungoa Māori is not lotions and potions. It is not natural health products. It is a way of knowing, doing, and being Māori. Awesome. Um, I guess in terms of like if other people want to know more about uh, about Rongoa and want to um, learn more, do you have any good guides or resources that you, you want to point people towards? So if you're looking for resources about Rongoa Māori, then, you know, you might want to go to the tywaiwaka.nz website and there's some excellent resources there that you could access. If you go to my website, which is kind of under review right now, but if you go to my website and you look on the news side, I think, there's articles I've written in the past about Rungwa Māori and understanding that. So you can go there and have a look at that. That's just aurinewzealand.com. If but the best way to know, the best way to learn is to get in touch with your Māori community where you are. Because, you know, Māori are not one people. We are a group of different, quite diverse people based on the geography and the, the topography of where we live, the resources available to us, our history, our different tūpuna. So, you know, get alongside your Māori community and start to learn and to understand the history of the whenua that you walk upon and as you do that, you'll become more and more connected to this whenua. The people who have lived on the land the longest are more able to hear it speak or hear her speak. And so when we recreate those connections, we can't help but connecting as humans as well. So I think if you want to learn more about Rungoa Māori, um, you can go to those two places. There are others they just don't come to mind right now. But don't limit yourself to that because you want a, as broad a perspective as you can get and then decide for yourself what works for you. So it's an awesome journey, but, you know, my one bit of advice is that for the people that I've seen that have started to move towards this space, it becomes bigger and bigger because you really often think you're coming to learn lotions and potions and body work, but it's so much more than that. Next minute you want to learn the real. Next minute you want to know all the money that live in the forest. Next minute you want to learn more about the ocean and the malamataka and then the marakai and all of those things. And it's all part of it. So we'll gravitate to the bit that speaks to us most. So there are lots of opportunities and avenues for learning about rungoa Māori. And they're hidden in plain sight. If you go and learn how to garden, you'll be learning about rungoa Māori. You learn about Taonga or the sounds of nature, you will learn about Rungwa Māori. You learn about Raranga weaving, you are learning about Rungwa Māori. Awesome. So, the last question I have for you is um, one that I actually ask all, all the people that come onto the podcast because I think it leaves us on a high note. Um, and also, I think it's a very good way of, um, I, I guess, it. it, it good way to think about what you're sort of doing and a great story behind it. So I guess the the simple question is, what's your favourite part of your job? Or is there a particular story that stands out to you as being quite remarkable from your job? There is, there are so many things about what I do in the field that I work in that I just love. It's not a vocation and now it's not even a choice. The bit that inspires me most is when I see Māori, I see the light go on in us as to just how wise and clever our tūpuna were in terms of the legacies that they have left us in order to guide us going forward. When we see those pūrāko as roadmaps, when we see the whenua, the taiao, as a blueprint for our own healing, when we see that light go on, that's that's what gives me the, the passion to keep going and keep sharing. Knowledge is not a right. It is a privilege 
to carry for those who will one day need it. And when we see that light start to go on, because many of us have been indoctrinated into a very Western model of living, even as Māori, so rooting people to the potential of Indigenous knowledge. And for those that are not Māori, for them to learn that their tūpuna were exactly the same. It's just so rewarding. So rewarding and so inspiring and so reminding of just how much more there is for us all to learn from those that have gone before us and how we apply that in a modern world. So, yeah, that's my gift from all this work to me, you know, the gift I take mm -hmm. from the work that I'm, I found myself doing. Well, excellent. Thank you so much for um, coming on and sharing your perspective. I've I've learned a lot. I'm sure everyone else is, um, will have learned a lot as well. Yeah, just thank you so much for, for coming on. It has been amazing um, to chat with you. Kilda Thomas, thank you for that. And thank you for the work that you do. I've seen a couple of your podcasts and I find them informative. So thank you for the mahi that you do. Oh, thank you so much. That, that means quite a lot. <laughs> Kia ora. Once again, I'd like to thank Donna for taking the time out of her day to come onto the podcast. It's a real privilege to speak to someone who knows so much more than me, and I hope you learned as much as I did. If you want to take a look at what Donna does, I've linked to Order New Zealand's website in the show notes. If you want to send me feedback, ask a question, suggest a topic, or just have a chinwag, you can find my email and social media on historyaotearoa.com. Aotearoa spelt A-O-T-E-A-R-O-A. -E you can also find helpful resources there, like transcripts, sources, and translations for some of the te reo Māori we have used. You can help support Hans through Patreon, buying merch, or giving us a review. It means a lot and helps spread the story of Aotearoa New Zealand. As always, haere tu atu, hoki tu mai. See you next time. <laughs> <laughs>